Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we are in Glasgow. On our panel, Kate Forbes, the SNP government's finance and economy secretary, the first woman to hold the office. MP for West Aberdeenshire and King Cardin since 2017, currently vice chairman of the Conservative Party with the responsibility for the young Conservatives, Andrew Bowie. Anna Sawa, an MP for five years. After losing his seat, he became a member of the Scottish Parliament and in February this year was elected leader of the Scottish Labour Party. Professor Heather McGregor, businesswoman and academic. For many years, the pen behind the FT's Miss Money Penny Finance column, currently executive dean of the Edinburgh Business School at Harriet Watt University. And Emmy Olivier and Golden Globe winning actor, keeping his Scottish roots warm in films such as Rob Roy and Braveheart, currently entertaining us in the new season of the HBO television drama Succession, Brian Cox. Welcome to my panel, welcome to the audience here in Glasgow and of course welcome to you at home to join in the conversation the usual way at BBC Question Time on social media and let's hear what you've got to say. Okay, we'll take our first question tonight which is from Alan, Alan Kukuba. Thank you Fiona. Uh, in light of UK-wide Covid cases remaining significantly high and deaths consistently averaging over 100 per day, should the government reimpose more restrictions to prevent a winter wave. Andrew, more restrictions, should the government impose them, given how, how infections are rising? Um, well, thanks for the question. Obviously, the rise in infections is something that is concerning the government. They continue to watch the data and continue to look at the trajectory on which we're headed. But we are very clear that the best way to beat this virus and to beat it back into submission, to allow the country to get on with its normal life, is to continue with the vaccine rollout and encourage everybody out there who's entitled to a booster vaccine to get that jab as soon as possible. If you haven't had the first jab, you haven't had the second jab, or you, you're entitled to the booster, please get it. And if you know a friend or a family member who's maybe reading something online about how the vaccine is harmful to their health, please have a word with them. Encourage them that the best way that they can protect themselves and their friends and family is to go out and get the vaccine. And what about course, all the people who are saying they can't, they're, they're trying to get a vaccine and they couldn't get one either because they couldn't get it through on through their GP or on the NHS app? Only yesterday, it was when I had a look to see if I could book one, it was saying uh, only front care, uh, frontline healthcare workers. That has changed, but just today. That has changed today. We're taking this steps. This is for the booster, of course. This is the booster. That has changed. We're taking steps to make the booster much more easily available to all those people who need it. But as I said, the vaccine is our way through this. The vaccine is our route back to, norma to normality and nobody wants to see a re-imposition of any of the restrictions that we had a year and a half ago. Of course, people should take sensible steps. That includes wearing a mask in crowded places. That includes uh, keeping Commons? good... Um, yes, so, I mean, people... Yes. Have been, people have been... Well, yes, I mean, people have been critical. Uh, people have been critical of, uh, of uh, the government benches for Conservative Party members of Parliament dominantly for not wearing uh, masks. I would suggest that over the summer and the first weeks of autumn, the situation looked very different uh, out there. But as Sajid Javid, the Health Secretary, said yesterday, we've got to recognise that we have a responsibility to set the tone and to set an example. And so I was encouraged today when I saw the television that a lot more of my colleagues were wearing okay. masks in the Commons. I certainly will be now, given the numbers that we're seeing, because I think we do have an example to lead... Uh, this country and to demonstrate that taking sensible small steps okay. like wearing masks in crowded places can have a big difference but the biggest difference is getting the vaccine and getting the booster if you're if you're able. So so Brian the UK recorded more than 50,000 covid infections today that's for the first time since July the question is should governments reimpose more restrictions what's your view? I, I think it's a mess it's an absolute mess <laughs> I think the left hand doesn't really know what the right hand's doing on this. And clearly, um, you know, it, it, I, I love the idea of normal life. And I, <laughs> we aren't living a normal life. What is normal life? It's certainly not like that at the moment, and it's not going to be like that, whatever that may mean, eventually. But I feel that, uh, that we, knew, we do need to be vaccinated. We do need to be responsible. I think Scotland, I have to say, is a very good example of what's going on. I think in the South, um, there's a lot of headless chicken activity, quite frankly. And I, I, it's interesting that, the, the, that the, uh, the Conservative Party are finally catching up and, and now they're all wearing masks. 
but they should have been wearing masks all the time as an example. And it's the example that's important for the people. Uh, you know, that's what Parliament's supposed to do. They're supposed to represent the people and the needs of the people. And so the masks are terribly important. They really are. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've had COVID. I know what it's like. I, in fact, in my case, it wasn't too bad. But at the same time, I just feel that we, we are a bit lax and we, we don't quite know what we want to do, what we're supposed to do. And I think we just have to be a little stringent in our whole policy on, 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 on masks, particularly. OK, lots of hands up. Lucy, you're the man in the glasses. Thank you. Um, Andy, with the greatest of respect, um, you're saying Sajid Javid has made these comments, but the um, Leader of the House openly said today... This is Jacob rees Yes, he about. said that... Um, Tory MPs don't need to wear masks because you all know each other. Now, I am a nurse who qualified and started at the very beginning of the pandemic. I have real lived experience of what it's been like for patients and families and also my colleagues who have worked until they are burnt out during this COVID crisis. But Kate, also our government aren't doing the best either. If I'm honest, you're talking, Brian, that, that Scotland's doing so much better. But our government, we're now having to deploy the military because of the large numbers of nursing vacancies in Scotland. So what is the government going to do to tackle that? We're about to come into the winter where everyone has been shielding. We've got massive amounts of colds and flu on top of COVID. And yes, vaccines are great, but we are... The NHS is bleeding. Mm -hmm. OK. question, Al's original question is that the British Medical Association thinks that the answer is yes. That with Sajid Javid talking about cases potentially rising to 100,000, now is the time to implement Plan B. Now, let's be clear, be clear what Plan B is. Plan B is a lot of the things that are already in place in Scotland. It's things as basic as wearing masks in certain situations. Now, Andrew has just alluded to the fact that he would support the wearing of masks. So I'm not one to tell the UK government what to do. But why on something as basic as wearing masks? It's not particularly onerous. It's not the most pleasant of things. But I'd far rather we saw an implementation of basic things like that than to resume restrictions. None of us want to see significant restrictions and on our lives. And what about the points that the man's, here, like masks, man's making in the glasses like here? And I think the gentleman makes a really important point. We are about to go into winter. It's pretty cold already. We are seeing the fact that the NHS has remobilised, so it's dealing with normal cases, as it were. And if there is a significant increase in cases, then that will add pressure. Now, what we are seeing so what's in Scotland... So what's your plan B for that? So, then? well, what we're seeing in Scotland is over the last four weeks that case numbers have fallen. So although they are plateauing they were very now, before they, they are plateauing. indeed, and they are falling just now, we want to continue that trajectory. And the way we do that is... They're, they're plateauing, okay, just to be clear, they're plateauing infections but they are, are but they have, plateauing. They are falling right now. We want to see them continue to fall. We want to see case numbers in Scotland continue to fall. They have the fallen. Plan, I'm really sorry to go. They have fallen, but, but now they're, they're plateauing. plateauing. Yes, just said. so we're clear. Yeah. So, so, so you've got masks, you've got vaccination mm -hmm. passports, but they're still not dropping. Yeah. So what, what, what do you think you can do, Scottish Government, to drive them down. Yeah, and I think there are a few things that we can continue to do. I mean, over 30 people died today from COVID. Mm. That's 30 families who are grieving the loss of a loved one. That is 30 people who we want to ensure um, uh, can, you know, uh, get the recognition they deserve and the hope that we can re-emphasise the need for all of us to follow basic precautions and the basic restrictions that are in place just now are all designed to keep us safe and it's the least we can do for the sake of the NHS, the sake of our nurses and ultimately to protect lives. Anna. Look, I, th I think it's important to recognise that across the UK cases are too high. I think it's also important to recognise that Scotland had a spike three or four weeks earlier and that's partly related to the fact that our schools it went back three weeks earlier than the English schools. Yeah. So I think we've got to look at the pattern alongside that. But there have been fundamental errors made by a UK government, but also fundamental errors made by a Scottish government. And I'm sorry, Scotland should aspire better than just being a wee bit better than Boris Johnson and Jacob rees <laughs> The reality is that 12,000 of our fellow citizens have lost their lives to this crisis. A third of those deaths have happened in care homes. We were sending COVID-positive patients into care homes in Scotland. So what would your virus, plan be now? Sending Alex? the virus to the very What would your plan be now? Is Labour supporting so, moving to, to so plan, plan B? So, so I, I think... Keir would, Starmer doesn't appear to I, I think plan B in itself is a recognition of a failure of plan A. 
And I think the government's got to get its plan with right. With Labour support moving uh, and, to that. And that, means, and that means getting a, a coherent strategy. It, it means getting test and protect right. So we have test and protect here in Scotland. You have test and trace in Scotland. Similar in, system, in, 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 just in different England. title. Tracing people properly is really important. We're still not getting testing right across the country so we can isolate the virus so, so and stop I'm people not getting kidding. the virus. So would you, so, so, it, would you so introduce in Plan B now? No, I would invest in test and protect. I would get the vaccine rollout up, ramped up. Rather than, okay. we know who's not vaccinated. We know where they live. We should be looking at door-to-door -door vaccinations. We should be looking at pop-up pop vaccination centres. Plan B is as basic as wearing a mask. It can, uh, including plan B wearing is a mask. as basic as wearing but, a but mask. But I think it has to be more than just wearing a mask. I think, so yes, a mask mm -hmm. is important. And yes, leadership matters. So uh, seeing parliamentarians giving lectures to the public about wearing a mask and then not wearing a mask themselves in Parliament sends a very negative message. So show leadership yourself, have a strategy. And also in Scotland, don't waste our time creating a vaccine passport scheme mm. that doesn't work, that is a distraction. And yet that's on Plan and B instead, in England. And instead, that is part instead, of plan focus, in England. instead focus on investing in test and trace and getting testing right okay. and getting vaccinations right across the There country. are lots of hands up. So Heather, I'll come to you in a second for you. I'm just going to get round the audience a little bit. Yes, the one there in the black and white skirt. Hi, um, I hear what you're saying about the vaccines and about masks and us trying to prevent getting COVID. However, at the moment, many people have COVID. They're phoning 111. They're phoning their GP. GP saying phone 111. They're on the phone for at least an hour to get through to numerous people while they're ill on the phone. The services at the moment are not fit for purpose. They're not set up. People are waiting outside to get into mm -hmm. hospitals. It really is a bad time at the moment if you have COVID. And that is... So what is the government doing knowing that we're actually going to get worse? Because we're not set up at the moment. And then the the top with the glasses. So do you think having 30,000 people descending Glasgow for COP26 is the right thing to do in this situation? <laughs> yes. What are you hearing in the, in the red sweater? Yes. As someone who works in education, it was... I felt like it was disrespectful for us to be the only ones in Category 1 key workers that were not offered the vaccination. We were in hubs the entire time. We have, we've gone back to full capacity since last August. Some of our, our staff still aren't vaccinated because of our age, despite the fact we are, we are frontline, kind of. Mm -hmm. And um, the children I work with don't even have to be tested. Mm. Those children can yep. be symptomatic and still come to nursery because they don't have to be yep. tested. So you're talking How is that protecting us? So you're talking about staff under 18, then, are you? Or, or when yeah, we have modern apprentices. Right, I see yeah. what you mean. The but the but also teaching top. staff, you know, there's a really important point. Teaching okay. staff. So if we accept that part of the spike is related to schools going back and schools being hubs about spreading the virus, actually teaching staff not getting rapid access to, to the booster programme and the second dose is part of the problem and puts greater risk on okay. those frontline staff. Yeah. So the lady's absolutely right, and I hope England can learn from that mistake now that their schools are going back that we made here in Scotland. Heather, let me bring you in now. Should governments reimpose more restrictions to prevent a winter wave? Uh, no, personally, I would like less restrictions, actually, because I'm sitting here in a room with 60 people in a university lecture theatre. I'm not allowed to do that at the moment, actually, at work. I can't teach a class of more than 50 people. Would, this would not be allowed. And... Uh, what I would like to see is all of the correct precautions that we're taking in Scotland, I think, are very good. We are masters in public places. We enforce that everywhere in the university. What, but, but unlike in England, we are not allowed to teach people in larger groups yet, even with social distancing. And so I would like to see that changed. You've got to remember that education in Scotland, higher education in Scotland, it generates millions and millions of pounds and lots and lots of jobs. And it's a really, so we have people coming from all over the world who actually this time have come back to Scotland. Mm -hmm. They've chosen to study in Scotland and they can't actually come to class because we don't at the moment have the same rules as England. The, this virus is with us, for, as, uh, as was said by Brian. This is going to be not normal life again forever. You know, th we are going to have to live with this for the rest of our lives. We need to find a way to work with it. And I, for one, would welcome fewer restrictions. Okay. The man in the pink top at the back. I've been fortunate enough, I've just come back from Spain and had to be tested. But personally speaking, I think the test we do ourselves at home is a farce. If you were being serious, we'd be sent to a national health testing area, pay for it, I don't mind paying for it, and it was tested by a professional. And then you would know it has been tested correctly. OK, the man there in the green top. 
Um, Anish Sar Sarwar's um, response to the question is just representative of what Scottish Labour have done over the last few years and have sat on the fence and have never given you a reason to vote for Scottish Labour. Okay. The woman there in the white T-shirt. Um, I'm a university student myself. I go to Caledonian and I really, really feel for the people who have come all the way here and paid well over £9,000 mm -hmm. and stayed here the whole time to have online lectures. I'm in university mm -hmm. three years. Uh, three, I've been in the university for three years and I'm in university physically for three hours a week. I don't pay for university. I'm lucky enough that I don't. But I've come here from the Netherlands, I've paid my dues and I'm in university for three, three hours. And even the, the online stuff, as they're trying really hard, but it's not cutting it. What are the government going to do for university students? Because we're really suffering. Mm -hmm. okay. This woman here in the front of the black T-shirt. People are taking lateral flow tests. They're going to concerts, having seen their negative. But that depends on the person because you're answering the own, your own question. So once you take that test, you ask, are you negative or positive? So if that person's not truthful, they can say they're negative, go to a concert and pass it on. Mm. There's no yeah. protection. Yeah. We've got a number of questions to get through tonight, so I'm going to move on. Before I do, I just want to tell you that next week we will be in Stockport with the entrepreneur and former Dragon's Den investor Jenny Campbell uh, and chairman of NatWest and former deputy governor of the Bank of England, Howard Davis. And the following, we're in Eastleigh, so do come along and join the debate. You can be in the audience now. It'd be great to see you, so do apply. You can apply on, apply on our Question Time website and you follow the link there. So, Stockport next week. Eastly, the week after, and we would love to see you. Right, let's take our second question, which is from Ingrid Rich. Ingrid. What is being done to protect women with the reported increase of spiking, including by injection, across Scotland and the UK? So this is... Um, Ingrid, you're referring to a number of reports that have come, uh, certainly from Scotland uh, and across uh, other parts of the UK, I think in Nottingham and Leeds, where women reporting having been spiked with needles in nightclubs and then, and then blacking out. Also, there's, there's women have reported having their drinks spiked, so tampered with before that. Is this something that's worrying you, Ingrid? Uh, I have generally never felt more unsafe to be a woman uh, going out and about. Um, I've, I've always been a bit worried about getting my drinks back, mm. but um, I just don't think that anyone would look after me if it, if it did, like staff members and bouncers in particular, they, they just seem to take you out of the club and get you a bit far enough away and, and, and get you leave out. you, yeah. Right, well, I'm sorry to hear that you've never felt more unsafe because that is not a position any, anyone or any woman wants to be in or to feel. Heather, I mean, I'm asking you, obviously, is in, in terms of your, your role at Harriet Watt University, when you hear something like Ingrid say something like that. I know, that. Ingrid, I, I, I really feel for you. I mean, nobody, as Fiona just said, nobody should feel like that. Yeah, I, um, so what can be done? I mean, that's, that's the question. Yeah, yeah and, and what can be done about it? Well, f first of all, you know, this, this is happening in clubs mainly. It's happening in big nightclubs, in crowded clubs. And I think that the venue owners and the venue managers should have a duty of care towards their customers. And I applaud the people that are um, boycotting some of these places because of this, because they haven't got a duty of care. Now, I have thousands of young people under my care, and uh, we have a duty of care towards them. I have uh, one and a half thousand of them actually living on campus alongside me. And we have a 24-hour app. I'm sure those of you in the audience who are students will know exactly what I mean, that, you know, when, you, when you, if anything happens 24-7, seven days a week, you just press the app and somebody will come to you. We run a central security service that will do that. And that is the kind of thing I think needs to happen. You know, these venues have to take the responsibility for the people that they have on the premises. They are, after all, handing over money. And I think that they need to exercise a duty of care. Kate, what can be done? Well, I would like to think that I could classify myself as, as a young woman in much the same shoes as you are. And I understand that fear, as I think so many women, not just in Scotland, across the UK and beyond, understand that fear and I think for from my perspective there's three things that I would say that one legislation is really important but it's never enough mm -hmm. you can have the legislation but there's two other things you need 
you need rigid enforcement of that legislation. And I know that Police Scotland are doing um, a, a lot of work right now to get to the bottom of those reports. But there's something else that we need that's perhaps even more important than legislation, and that is a cultural change. And... <laughs> Police Scotland recently produced a hugely powerful video aimed at, at men who are, you know, I have a lot of men in my life who I uh, love dearly, my, my father, my husband, but men need to be in a position to be empowered to call out other men Absolutely. who are not behaving Absolutely. as they should be behaving. <laughs> the woman with a then. But it is a wider debate. I think it's important that prevention should be seen rather than a cure and legislation won't solve everything. I think that um, people need to be aware of what children and what boys are being exposed to on the internet and that what is acceptable and how people should be treated equally and why women have to be fearful of what they're actually, where they're going and if they can go out clubbing, whereas actually it's the people, the perpetrators, and the focus should be on them and on educating them that this is not acceptable and that it has, it will need to change and that people will stand up and say, no, this isn't just part of society and that girls need to be careful. It's the people who are t taking part and doing this that need to be called out. Man in the I'm a Glasgow taxi driver, and I've been picking up uh, girls like this for years, actually. Um, when you say girls like this, what do you mean? Well, I'll give you a for instance. I picked up um, a lady who was married with a couple of kids, who was out with her friends for a couple of drinks. Uh, the next, when I pick her up, she's coming from a house, half past five in the morning. She doesn't know how she got there. Mm. She knows the people, but she's married, two kids. And how does she explain it to her husband, she says to me? She refuses to go to the police because of that. It's been going on for years. Oh, I see. So you're saying that that, that she, she had drink or, or, or had been spied or, or she had yeah. been interfered with in some yeah, way. Yeah, it was spiking drinks for years. Is, is, is what was going on? Not the, the the jags, but the spiking drinks has been going on for years. I think actually the only way to stop it is to introduce maybe the, the equivalent of um, if someone's got a knife. You know, if someone's using that, they should be looking at a prison sentence maybe for a year. 18 months, that would nip it in the bud and that would actually send a signal to these guys. We're too soft. Yes, the woman there. In 2016, the Scottish Government actually produced a, an equally safe act and it was made a priority to look after women and gendered violence. It's not been done. I think the Scottish Government has failed on that. Yeah, it's, been, it's, it's, it's been passed, but, it's just, but yeah. nothing has changed. Uh, Brian, I mean, I don't know how much you've been following this, but these reports that have come out in yeah. the papers recently. I mean, spiking with a needle, it's not something well, this, I had ever is, heard of This before. is the question for me, is the accessibility of the drug. Mm. Nobody's actually looking at that. How do these people get this drug? Well, we don't know what it... We don't know what well, what, the I mean, drug the is idea anything, of a hypodermic know. needle, do they fill the hypodermic? Do they... I mean, and there's, there's, there's that which I... I it's a very... Nobody's really looking at that element, you know, because, you know, folk behave in a certain kind of way uh, after drinks or what have you. But I find it extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the idea of what this drug is and how the accessibility this drug is and how, where are they getting the drug from? You know, where is it? Who's, who's giving this drug? And I feel that we're not looking at that because we know that people are going to behave in a certain way and, uh, and it's terrible. It's just dreadful. I mean, the, I couldn't believe it when I heard today about this, the needle. And I'm thinking, and these, these lassies having to wear these thick coats in order to protect themselves. But I'm thinking, where is this drug and how are they getting it? And I think we also have to look at that. And nobody's actually talked about that. Nobody's actually talked about what the drug is and the accessibility of the drug. And I think if you can talk about, if you can start to go down that route, apart from the obvious other routes, then perhaps we'll begin to understand what it is that's going on. So look at the toxicology of it, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think Kate, Kate's right. It's, it's about legislation, but more importantly, it's about culture. And we, we passed a hate crime bill in the last parliament, but we didn't include the largest hate crime, which is sexism and misogyny, in that hate crime bill, which I think was an absolute failure. And I think that's something that should be corrected. <laughs> I think there's a more fundamental point here. Uh, yes, the spiking is horrific, and we've got to take the urgent and immediate action to address it. 
But let's be honest about this. Every single day, there are women in our country who have to think twice before they walk down certain streets, yeah. who have to look over their shoulder when they're out on a Friday or a Saturday night, who have to double-check the charge on their battery, who have to think about how they travel to and from places. And so we've got to address that fundamental issue. And for those that think the answer to this is women thinking about how they change their behaviour, I'm sorry, frankly, that's wrong. No, Men need to think about how they change their behaviour. Because, <laughs> because we, can, we should not be living in a society where any human being, regardless of their gender, their faith, their, their sexuality, has to think twice about where okay. they go. And that's sad, the sad reality of the Scotland and the UK we live in right now. We've got to fundamentally change it. The woman there in the black sweater. Gender-based violence doesn't just happen to women. No. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sarwar, again, you mentioned misogyny. Do you know what the male equivalent is of, of misogyny? Look, look, it's, it's misandry. There's actually a word for it. Um, I appreciate that violence against women is it's horrendous, it's on the rise, and, 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 it's, the great, and, and it's, it's the terrible, greater part. And it is the greater part. But we shouldn't forget that it does happen to men as well. Men get their drinks spiked, men get jabbed. And I think, it's, I think it would be a mistake to focus completely only on female... If we talk about gender violence and we only ever talk about women, we forget that it happens to men. The woman here in the blue, blue dress, yes. Hi, I'm a former police inspector, having served in Scotland and down in the Met and county forces. Um, and I just want to look at some of the aspects of what the, the panel have been saying about this. First of all, we need to gather intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get people coming forward, male or female, coming forward and talking to the police, allowing themselves to be forensically examined because we don't know what type of needle it is because I'm sitting here and thinking it could be an EpiPen because an EpiPen is far easier to disguise and use. But we need to do the toxicology and find out what it is. Yeah. So we need to do this intelligence gathering. When it comes to evidence and trying to find out who the perpetrators are, that is a tremendously difficult, difficult aspect. Because if you talk to the CPS or you talk to Pro uh, Procreative Fiscal, the evidence has got to be there where you've got an opportunity of taking something to court. Is there a, is there a realistic prospect of a prosecution being successful? Um, and we hear so often about sexual assaults that are not successful at court. And that's one of the reasons why, because gathering the evidence is so, so difficult. So where does that leave Police Scotland and all the other 43 forces in the country, at least them thinking about how can we use things that we've used before to um, support people who want to come and report things, relatives of people who want to come and say something's not right about this. And the intelligence format is so, so important in that respect. Otherwise, we might never, ever get to the bottom of this. Andrew. What is being done to pr protect women with reported increases spiking across well, first, the UK? Well, firstly, it's, it's absolutely horrific. Um, the stories that are, are coming out over the last few days, and I pay huge tribute to, I think it's at the University of Edinburgh, uh, the Girls' Night In campaign, who are boycotting uh, venues uh, to, to sort of shine a light on this. I mean, I feel a great sense of... Well, I feel quite ashamed, actually, in the same way that I felt ashamed when, after the tragic uh, murder of Sarah Everard, so many of my female friends and family members tell stories. Oh, yeah, I felt, you know, uncomfortable walking home one night a few weeks ago. And I, as, as a man, I just had no idea How that there was this. How is it possible that you had no well, idea? Well, I, I, it, they, because so many of them were just, for, for whatever, had so ashamed to talk about it. They didn't go to the police, they didn't want to talk about it. They felt, they felt stupid talking about it. I think this, this is wrong, and that's where Kate is absolutely right. This is a culture change, a, a shift that we need in this country. We need to educate men into the dangers that women face going out that they shouldn't face. As Anna said, you shouldn't be afraid to, to go about your, your, your business, go on a night out and, and feel scared to go home or feel scared to, to ask a policeman for help or whatever it is. And so we do need a culture shift. We should also be clear that these men who are going into clubs and spiking these drinks or using uh, hypodermic needles or EpiPens, as, as, as you suggest, 
These are vile, pernicious individuals who are going to take advantage of young, vulnerable women, and they should get everything thrown at them that we can throw at them uh, in this country. But yes, we need an education shift, we need a culture shift, and we as men need to be much more aware of the dangers that so many women in this country feel that they face going about their daily business. OK, I'm going to take another question from Dan Bloor. Dan, where are you? Uh, as... Right, as COP26 approaches, could you tell us, uh, in the situation of an independent Scotland, would you put the economy or environment first when choosing what to do with the domestic oil industry? Okay. It doesn't need to be exclusive, I don't think. I don't think it's one or the other. One of the great opportunities over the next three weeks, in my humble opinion, are the economic opportunities that come for Scotland as a result of that just transition. Now, sadly, not all the levers are within Scotland. And we saw a decision made this week. One of the greatest opportunities for Scotland was the ACORN project, uh, carbon capture and storage in the North East, the most well-advanced project, the most cost-effective project. We were uh, sincerely hoping that the UK government would invest uh, the billion pounds that had been promised. And instead, that money is going to projects in England. Uh, and I think the BBC reported it as jaw-dropping. Now, that could have created... Um, several uh, thousand jobs. I don't jobs. think the BBC would have expressed that opinion. I must. It may have been someone in a BBC report said it was jaw-dropping. It was jaw-dropping, right. indeed. Uh, it, it, a lot of jobs dropped in the North East, whether or not they support me and my party. Um, there was a lot of surprise. Now, opportunities but what about, like what that... about in terms of the domestic oil industry? If, the question, if, you're, yeah. if you've got a legally binding target, target, which you have, to achieve net zero emissions by 2045, <clears> when do you envisage phasing out well, the domestic oil industry? Yeah, so this is my point, that with a just transition, there are opportunities to create new jobs when it comes to that phasing out. And the carbon capture and storage in the northeast is a great example. You've got the infrastructure there from the oil and gas industry. You've got the skills there. You've got a lot of the investment there. Now, if you take that and redeploy that through something like carbon capture and storage with the investment behind it, but the key is you need the investment behind it then you're creating jobs as we make that just transition. And okay, you're your, part, your partners in government, the Green Party, are against investment in any carbon capture and storage. And your leader, Nicola Sturgeon, is unable to say whether she supports further exploration and drilling in the North Sea. Andrew, a few and we months have seen ago, the dangers of Andrew, not having a domestic supply. A few supply. months ago, you stood up in the House of Commons talking about the benefits of the North East initiative and project. Absolutely. This week, the UK government chose to bypass the most advanced and cost-effective carbon capture and storage opportunity in the UK, which is in the North East. So the North East economy has contributed uh, three, over £350 billion of oil revenues over the last few decades. All it would have taken is £1 billion to contribute, to donate, to invest in the North East to ensure that we do see that just transition from oil and gas to new economic opportunities, so the, and that did not happen. So, Kate, it's the Conservative government in London that is investing £16 billion in the transition fund to move us uh, into this uh, not new in the renewables uh, future. Yes, in the northeast of Scotland. We've invested in the Oil and Gas Technology Centre in Aberdeen, the, the, the subsea hub of excellence, uh, which is going to be created in, in my constituency. £2.3 billion of tax relief for companies operating out of Aberdeen to make the North Sea the most attractive basin in which to invest in the world. And in terms of carbon capture and storage in the Scottish cluster and the ACORN project, of course, it was disappointing that it didn't achieve Tier 1 status. But it is a reserve uh, cluster. It does mean that it still remains in the programme. And the UK government has spent £31 million already working with the Scottish cluster. And I hope that we can advance the time frame because we're going to need much more than the two Tier 1 projects if we're going to be serious about <coughs> developing this technology. And I remain committed to working with the UK government and with the Scottish cluster to advance it more in the future because the Conservative Party is investing and does care about the North East of Scotland, unlike the Scottish National Party government in Edinburgh. Brian. Oh, sorry. I, I... <laughs> Joseph, I guess you're looking skyward. I mean, <laughs> this is not a party political issue. We're in deep shit. We really are. And we really have to face up to that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm well... In, to use the Scottish word, I'm well and truly scunnered, quite frankly. Uh, I, 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 you know, we, we're in, you know, we've just had this report coming out just now, which has just been released today, about the, the investigation that they found out that uh, both the South America and Australia and Saudi Arabia want to circumvent what's going on. And we are, the planet is being destroyed. 
And we have to rethink it. We have to make certain sacrifice in order to get better. And we're, we, we, keep, we, can't, we still want to fall into, well, we can't afford that because we'll lose that. But we have to think first and foremost about the planet and our responsibility to the planet. And that's the key. And, and, I mean, the question is about an independent Scotland putting the economy and the environment first. Well, I think they have to put the economy, the environment first. I mean, I really do. I think okay. that's the advantage that we can... That's the... I mean, we're a small country, and we could show example. Now, the Saudis are not going to do it. Australia's not going to give up their coal that easily. And we have to... We can do that. The great thing about our country is we are the particular, and we are small, and we can actually take those... We can make those sacrifices, because ultimately we could afford it. So phasing out the but, oil industry. Not, yeah. But we only make those challenge. advances yeah. in technology through private investment and private... Uh, fun, and, and you just have to look at the, the, the work that's being done by companies in the North East, in Aberdeen, in these brand new technologies that are coming on stream and are really going to power our, our way towards net zero in 2050, to driving down our carbon emissions. And by the way, the UK's got a very good story to play. We're leading the G, G20 in terms of cutting our carbon emissions. Well, we have we could, to do better. I agree with you. We do have to we go have further to do and faster. Better. And it's not a party political game. You're absolutely right. The woman back there in the red top. Yes, you. Hi. Hi. Um... The infrastructure was in place already in Scotland and it just had to be reversed. And once again, I believe Scotland have been overlooked by Westminster in their decision making. And it's one more reason why I would vote independence. I would be so proud for there to be an independent Scotland. And there's only one thing that I kind of sigh about when it comes to um, the Scottish Government as it is, um, and that's, you know, that, yeah, we had a perfect setup there for carbon capture, and I do feel we've been overlooked yet again, but animal agriculture is the second biggest cause of climate change before transport, and not only has the UK Government ignored it, but Scottish Government is continuing with that, and I think we're too... We, we, we've done this with the energy industry. We've left it too long, and only now are we prepared to stand up to these industries and say, we need to do something different. We need to stop listening to lobbyists and put the real issues first. Are we going to ignore that with animal agriculture, or are we going to start to make proper just transitions now because it is already too late? The man on the beach. Uh, Andrew, Andrew just mentioned uh, that um, they're investing billions and billions in the North East. That's just to cover up what he actually sold away. He allowed the UK government to take that money out of uh, Scotland and invest in the North of England. And in a typical Tory fashion, Sorry, he, start, he, he starts he? hitting us with all this thing about we've invested £132 billion, £125 billion. Nobody can check all these figures. And the Tory ministers are good at this for everything to do. The first thing they bring in is their, their investment in this, their investment in that. He sold Scotland down the river by not allowing the North East project to go ahead. When you say he, you're referring to... Andrew. Oh, to Andrew himself, I so, Right. It's not far away from his constituency. He probably represents that area. Well, I don't represent St Fergus itself, but, uh, of course, <coughs> the subsea technology, which is very much... and the industry, which is very much based in my constituency, obviously, is invested heavily in it. Hence my disappointment yeah. they didn't get one Boris, tier Boris one. told you that Hence it's not going to happen in Scotland. Hence and my you're disappointment like a wee boy, that it didn't get tier you're one like status. You're like a schoolboy but... says, OK, Boris, if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. Never mind Scotland, you do what you want when you're levelling it up. Which well, is... So it's still in the pipeline. This is the this is the this is this is the this is the, not for some years. This is the this is the truth of the matter. The UK government is committed yeah. to working with the Scottish government to, to develop answer. and uh, move the plans forward so that it can come on stream. Yesterday was only the, the start of the story. <clears throat> We're a long way from actually developing clusters around the UK that we can sort of take forward CCUS at the, the scale that we need to. And I'm really confident that, that in time, the Scottish cluster will uh, be a part of our, our overarching plans uh, to do that. But we are investing. Billions in transition. We're investing in the North. You'll need to have a look at the... Where's all the billions coming from? 
OK. All right, I'm just going to get... Forgive me, sir. I'm going to get around the rest of the panel, otherwise it will just be you and the Andrews show, which <laughs> it has, it has a slightly entertaining side in, in some ways, but I think let, let's move on. Anna, so I want to come to you. Um, so the question is, as COP26 approaches, could you tell us whether an independent Scotland would put economy or environment first when deciding what to do with the domestic oil industry? Look, I think the, the challenge is climate change doesn't recognise borders. So to, to tr turn an issue of global cooperation and the eyes of the world being on Glasgow and the requirement for international leaders to work together to challenge climate change, to do the, the very thing that Brian says we need to do to confront the climate emergency and save the planet, to reduce that to a constitutional debate about Scotland's place in the UK, I think frankly <coughs> misses the point. The reality is we have two failing governments in Scotland when it comes to climate change. We can't repeat the mistakes of the mining industry when entire communities were decimated and there wasn't a pathway to alternative employment. We can't make that same mistake in the North East. The UK government should be doing more in terms of that carbon capture project in the North East, but also the Scottish government can be doing more. The Scottish government promised that we would have 130,000 green jobs mm. by 2020. We've actually only created 21,400 green jobs in Scotland with the powers that we already have. So what we need to do is take the opportunity of COP26 when political leaders, both at home but abroad also, stop talking the rhetoric of climate change and actually turn it into meaningful action so we can change the planet. That means leading by example. That means when we talk about integrated public transport so we can get people out of gas-guzzling vehicles, we don't cut routes in Scotland at the same time, meaning that our rail workers are going to be going on strike in Glasgow at the very time when international eyes are on us. When we talk about protecting the global environment, it means not cutting the environmental budget here in Glasgow, meaning our cleansing workers are going to be going on strike during COP26. That's a, a, an idea of shame okay. and embarrassment for our city and for Scotland, and I think we can do frankly better than that. Heather. Well, I think it's very the sad versus the environment. that we are focusing on the things that divide us when actually what we should be focusing on is the things that unite us. And I think every single person in this room would want a better planet and a stronger environment. But in my experience, the way to get that is a strong economy. So you, it's not an either or. You have to have one and the other. And actually, there are things that we could all do to make that happen, because we're not going to get a stronger environment by working out where the carbon capture goes or um, you know, using another uh, reusable coffee cup. What will really make the difference is massive, massive innovation. And massive innovation does not happen. It's the kind of stuff that's going on in the labs of universities all over Scotland right now. And it doesn't happen without somebody funding it. And it will not be enough for governments to fund it. We need private capital mm -hmm. to fund it. So you need a strong economy to deliver a strong environment. Absolutely right. And I and everybody here, everybody here with a private pension fund for a start, should be putting their foot down about where that money is invested. Because it needs to be invested for the long, long term. And you need to be investing now for 30, 40, 50 years away. So, personally, I don't think there is a choice to be made between the environment and the economy, because you need a very strong environment to support the economy, and you need a very strong economy to support the environment. Okay. I'm going to take another question from Anmar Al Ansari. What, if any, further protections should politicians have in light of the events of last week? Uh, Anas. Look, I think... The fundamental thing to say is nobody should feel unsafe at work and certainly no one should be uh, killed at the work, regardless of what sector um, they work in. Have you felt and unsafe at work? I know there was an incident when you, you very yeah, first I've, started I've, campaigning. I've, 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 I've had some uh, pretty high-profile cases around um, threats that were left on my office phone, threats that have come on YouTube videos, <laughs> threats that have been sent through the post. Um, and I've, you were I've punched, been... weren't you, when you first started Yeah, I was, I was uh, punched as a teenager um, in, a, in a racist incident. I, my, my earliest political memory is uh, waking up and going out to school and, and seeing a letter on uh, my front porch and opening up. And there was a picture mocked up of my mother with two, uh, tied to a chair with two guns pointed to her head um, and cut out letters saying, bang, bang, that's all it takes. Um, and that was a message from, at that time, Combat 18, uh, who were upset about the fact that we might be on the verge of electing Britain's first Muslim member of parliament, who was uh, my father um, at the time. So we've seen threats uh, against politicians. We've seen attacks on democracy. What do we do about it? Uh, one part, I think, is uh, recognising that, of course, politics is going to have high emotions. And, of course, there's a place for anger in politics as well. 
I think the challenge for all of us, though, is not to allow that anger mm. and that emotion to turn into dislike and hatred. Uh, we all have very different political views uh, on the stage, myself, Andrew, and uh, Kate in particular. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to dislike each other or hate each other in the process. Uh, we can uh, be very civil, uh, but still be angry and passionate about our politics. Uh, the further thing I would say is we can't escape the fact that our public discourse and our political discourse also is part of the problem. Uh, too much of our politics is about othering communities. It's about dehumanising other people and it's about creating divisions amongst ourselves. And I think we've got to recognise that until we challenge that and we challenge the politics of anger with the politics of empathy, we challenge the politics of division with the politics of unity, and we challenge, frankly, a politics of despair that we feel as a society and a country with a politics of hope, we are going to continue to see these horrific uh, threats, and I hope not in terms of horrific incidents itself. So, yes, there's a wider issue about individual protection, uh, and look, we're all family uh, members, our families are concerned, our staff uh, are concerned about their own safety. But I think there's a fundamental issue here about how we do politics, how we protect our democracy, and how we keep that fundamental okay. importance in our democracy of face-to-face -face contact and recognising that our politicians are there to serve the people and be accessible to the people, not be separate from the people. So the question, Andrew, is what, if any, further protection should there be in the light of, obviously, the terrible killing of Sir David Amos. Yeah, and I can't help thinking that this time last week, David was in his constituency in Southend, you know, preparing for a very normal Friday in many respects for members of parliament, members of the Scottish parliament, who'd be hosting a constituency uh, surgery, where I'm sure he felt as safe uh, as he ever had done in the near 40 years that he served his constituents uh, in the House of Commons. So do um, you think there should be further protections? It's, the protection should be there if a member of parliament feels that they uh, require it or that their staff should require it. But we've, we've got to be very careful to balance that with keeping the, the so very important aspect, almost unique in our democracy, which is the openness and the accessibility of elected representatives to their constituents. We do absolutely need to do something about the tone of the debate in our politics. It's, we have lost and are losing, and you see it in social media, and I see some of the abuse that uh, some of my colleagues get. We are losing, I think, fast the ability to disagree agreeably. And if anything could change in the light of last week's tragic events, given how he went about his business, a man with very strong-held views, some of which I disagreed with, but he would do it in a courteous, polite and amiable manner. And we need to get back to that in this country. It, not just uh, between ourselves as politicians, but out in the country as a whole. And to answer the original question, if an MP, MSP or anybody in public service, because it's not just elected representatives, feels unsafe, then yes, of course, the protection should be available to them to allow them to carry out their business representing this country in whatever capacity they are doing that. Man here in the front. Yes, what can we do using legislation? Um, should capital punishment be brought back? Have you as a nation gone too soft? Is that something you'd like to see? Yes, I would. What would you feel like if your young daughter got killed or your elderly father got killed for just doing their job? Uh, I think OK, I'm going, I to think... I'm going to come round the audience and then I'll come back to you. Yes, the man in the glass. Legislation. Surely, no, it's not just for MPs, MSPs to get the extra protection. We need to do it for the whole of society. Because in this area, in the last five days, there's been two fatal stabbings. So surely we, we need to clamp down more on the punishment for anyone caught carrying a knife rather than just looking at it from an, an MP or an MSP's point of view? Well, I mean, we were talk, discussing it simply because that was the question. That, I mean, one of those studies was of a 14-year-old. I mean, yeah. particularly, mm -hmm. particularly distressing. So, Kate, okay, the question is, what, if any, further protection should politicians have? I mean, you're all talking about if they, if they feel... If politicians feel concerned, they should have protections. But what should they be? Is it, is this, is it having a, a police officer station in every constituency surgery? Or what, what is it? Practically, what does it mean? I mean, it's not that, is it? Because the bread and butter of my job is surgeries with constituents. It's meeting people face to face. Now, through COVID, that's been more difficult. I've had virtual surgeries, but you cannot escape. And I would never want to. It's the part of the job I love the most, being out in my uh, very beautiful constituency, almost as beautiful as Glasgow, meeting people face 
to face. But I don't think there's any politician, I can't think of any, who haven't had to face threatening behaviour, mm. who haven't been subject to intimidating threats. And the challenge for all of us is that the worst atrocities start somewhere. And they start with these intimidating threats. They start with anger fueled dehumanising language, so often on social media. And I guess for me, it, it starts with all of us, again, calling out that dehumanising language, because every politician does have family. You know, scrutinise, criticise, hold politicians accountable, do all of that, that's the lifeblood of our democracy. But don't dehumanise to the lengths that some might, uh, that then results in those atrocities. And I do see good examples. I mean, this week, if I could use one short um, example, I met up with a Conservative councillor who posted on Facebook or that, that she'd met with me, and there was a post there that was less than flattering about me. She called it out, she blocked the person, and she said she wouldn't tolerate it. Credit where it's due, well, that's the leader of Borders Council, and I was really impressed. Yeah. So, um, Heather, what, if any, further protections? Because, I mean, talking about changing culture is, is, is good and all very well, but that takes time. That does take time. What can be done in the, in the short and, to medium term? In the shorter time, I think that there will almost certainly have to be an approach uh, by our members of parliament and our members of Scottish parliament that triages uh, things in the same way that GP surgeries do and that, that they are, there will have to be some element of screening. Um, but what I would say is, you know, this was a tragedy. It was a tragedy for Sir David and for his family. It was a tragedy for the people of South End. We don't want an equivalent tragedy which is that we let terrorism win mm. by standing between our elected members of Parliament and members of Scottish Parliament and the people that they represent. I am represented in Parliament by Christine Jardine. I am represented in the Scottish Parliament by Gordon MacDonald. I have never met either of them, I, but I would like to think that if I wanted to, I could. And the thought that that might not be possible, I think, is tremendously sad. We don't want to heap a tragedy on another tragedy. Brian. I think there's a, 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 an ex well, there's a thing happening at the moment which I think we do have to protect our representatives because they are our representatives and we need to make sure that they are safe, first and foremost. But in this extraordinary man who I didn't know, Sir David Ames, I mean, what's, what comes across about his life was this was a man who was very ecumenical in his beliefs. You know, he had great... Uh, relationships with our Islamic brethren, for example. And this, to me, and clearly this man was targeted. He was targeted because of that very reason, because he actually was across the divide. And I mean, we, we, the, we, we have no idea why, why he was killed, of course. No, yes. we don't know, but, but I just thought it was shocking. I mean, I, I, I saw this, this wonderful kind of... when a group of... The Islamic Brethren came along and we were talking about him and how much they respected this man and how wonderful this man was. And I just thought, now this is a good guy. This is one of the good and guys. Yep. And they're killing one of the good guys. That's what scared me. Right. We have got about five minutes left. I want to get one question in very quick, so you all have to be reasonably brief, <laughs> if you would, which is from Ashley Hanney. Um, Glasgow's refuse services have been severely impacted by the pandemic. Our city is currently littered with rubbish and rats. With COP26 coming, which I welcome, by the way, I just wonder, is this the right time to be showcasing our city? What do you think? I think that it might be... It could be embarrassing for the city. Could be embarrassing? Could be, yep. Annas? Well, we have our cleansing workers going on strike during COP26 because of the state of our streets and the cuts to cleansing services. We have our real workers going on strike because we're cutting routes uh, here in Scotland at a time when we're trying to tell people to get out of cars and get into public transport. We had an announcement today that bus drivers in Glasgow are planning on going on strike during COP26. And this is a direct result of us seeing one rhetoric on the international stage and the national stage and cutting local budgets for local people in our communities at the same time, which is completely and utterly unacceptable. Glasgow is the greatest place in the world. I love the city of Glasgow. I was born, up, born here, brought up here, proud to represent it. We call ourselves the dear green place. But this dear green place is being let down by cuts to local government, cuts to local budgets, and okay. not supporting... You're going to have to be energy. brief, I'm sorry. I'm just going to take you back to the original question, uh, which is, Glasgow's refuse service has been impacted by the pandemic, our city is littered with rubbish and rats. 
great having COP26 at Glasgow. Is this how Glasgow should be portrayed on the world stage? Kate, what would you well, say? Well, there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of work being done right now with uh, people out on a daily basis, uh, ensuring that the rubbish is collected, that the fly tipping is cleared and that the graffiti is wiped off. Every single city is oh, going to have to Just as you said that, a whole the raft the of hands went up. Let me just say very quickly, I've got Dennis, I've heard from you already, forgive me. Man in the white shirt, you have to be really quick. Um, one of the things that I always think the Scottish Government does is put a plaster over things. So this... <laughs> the way they will be funding put into this for about three weeks and then when everyone leaves, when this international event is ended, we'll come back to... There's litter okay. everywhere. Heather. You know, this is an oh, 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 sorry, oh, you've literally got about 30 seconds. I'll give you 15 seconds. I Go mean, on. Glasgow has a proud heritage of hosting international events and showcasing the best of Glaswegian hospitality and welcoming people. I think that's what we should be celebrating in okay. the run-up to COP. Pay the workers so they don't go on yeah. strike. This, this is the most amazing city. This is the city where 300 years ago Adam Smith studied. You know, and you know it wasn't. There was no rubbish collection in those days, and it was still the best city in the world. You know, your the the, the motto here that this city is let Glasgow flourish. I think Glasgow will flourish in COP26. Like you, I welcome it. I think it's going to be a great okay. two weeks, rubbish or not. Brian? I think it's great that Glasgow is hosting COP26. Yeah. And what about the point that, uh, that you're making there about, about the uh, issues with rubbish collection, rats, fly well, tipping, what have you? I mean, that's life. <laughs> OK, that's life. Andrew? <laughs> Well, I disagree slightly. I think for the people who are living in Glasgow, it shouldn't be life. I think that uh, Glasgow City Council could... Uh, well, I agree. Uh, it shouldn't be life, but it is life at the moment. Pick, pick, pick their game up. In yeah. we, we've seen Glasgow at its best. We saw in 2014 the amazing uh, uh, Glasgow that was demonstrated to the world through the Commonwealth Games and Aberdeen winning the League Cup. Um, and, and that's <laughs> we, what we know Glasgow can be. And I really hope that Glasgow City Council and the Scottish Government can step up and get it back to where it was then, because Glasgow deserves that. And the, 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 we should be concentrating on what the negotiating, negotiations are uh, being, uh, the negotiations are being held behind closed doors and not okay. on the fact the litter's not being picked, picked up or the is not time being picked up one more around thing, Glasgow. One more thing from the audience. Yes, the woman there with the long hair at the back. Um, it's just for like, um, like, for an event that's meant to be about protecting the environment, Having the place covered in rubbish, it kind of gives the mixed messages, which is kind of what makes that embarrassing. Okay. Like, you know. All righty. I have to say, our time is up. There's, there's lots of hands shot up with this. I'm sorry I couldn't give you more time, but we're out of time. Thank you very much to the panel for coming this evening. Thank you to all of you for coming and being such an engaging audience here in Glasgow. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching from Glasgow and Question Time. Bye-bye.